In the previous lecture, we computed surface area. Our next type of integration is going to be integrating over a domain which is actually part of a surface. The differential for this will be d capital S, where I like to think of that as a little piece of surface area. So as far as our differentials go, when we integrated over areas in the xy plane, it was dA. When we went up to triple integration, it was dV. Then we saw ds, that was integration with respect to arc length, etc. So here, the domain of integration is part of a surface. So when we chop it up, we're breaking the domain up into little pieces where our notion of the area of the base would be like the surface area of the base. Therefore, a surface area integral, when we compute the area of a surface, we can view that as double integrating 1 ds. As we saw, how we actually compute that is we parametrize our surface with r of u and v for parameters u and v coming from some domain d, and then we double integrate over d the length of the cross product ru cross rv du dv. So we can relate this new differential d capital S to the differentials du dv with ds is like the length of this cross product du dv. Okay, suppose we have some scalar valued function of three variables, f of x, y, and z, which is continuous and defined on some surface s, for which we have a parametrization r of u and v, with parameters u and v coming from some domain d and r2. Then the surface integral of f, where we're integrating over that surface, in its general form, we write it as the double integral over s of f ds, and then computationally, using our parametrization, we evaluate this as the double integral over d of f of r of u and v times the length of the cross product r sub u cross r sub v du dv. I like to think of this as analogous to how we set up and solve scalar line integrals. So this is a scalar surface integral. We'll do a couple examples. We probably won't integrate this all the way to a final number, but let's at least set up the surface integral of the function f of x, y, and z equals x times y over the portion of the paraboloid z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared that lies in the first octant above the plane z equals 5. So here I've sketched the paraboloid over the plane z equals 5, but we're actually only interested in the first octant. So we only want a portion of this surface, and in particular we're only interested in the first octant. So let me highlight that in the xy plane which I've sketched at the bottom of this picture. We see the shadow of the portion we're interested in over here. It makes sense to me to parametrize this surface using polar coordinates. So in particular, let's have r of u and v be u cosine v for the x-coordinate, u sine v for the y-coordinate. For the right bounds on u and v, that's going to give us that quarter disk in the xy plane. And then x squared plus y squared would be u squared. So when we turn to the z coordinate, 9 minus x squared minus y squared would be 9 minus u squared. To determine the bounds, let's look at the radius first. In the picture, it's clear that the radius is 2, but how would we figure that out? We would need to know how that paraboloid intersects the plane z equals 5, because the edge of our disk shadow down here is directly underneath the intersection of our paraboloid and the plane z equals 5. So when that paraboloid intersects that plane, it's the case that both z equals 9 minus x squared minus y squared and z equals 5. In other words, 5 equals 9 minus u squared. So u squared equals 4, so u equals 2. Okay, so the bounds on u and v are going to be from 0 to 2 for u. And then since we're only getting a quarter disk in the xy plane, our angular parameter v is going to go from 0 to pi over 2. Okay, so that's our domain of integration. 
Next, we want to evaluate our function on this parametrization. So that's going to be f of u cosine v, u sine v, 9 minus u squared. f takes the first two coordinates and multiplies them together. So this is going to be u squared cosine v sine v. Okay, next we need to compute the cross product and its length. So r sub u will be cosine v sine v negative 2u. And r sub v will be negative u sine v, u cosine v, 0. Written in this way, it's pretty easy to take their cross product. I don't have to set up a new 3 by 3 array because this would be like the second row and this would be the third row. So we can just kind of do the cross product as written. We'll get that the length of the cross product will be the length of the vector whose first component is 2u squared cosine v, whose second component is 2u squared sine v, and whose third component is u cosine squared minus negative u sine squared, so that's overall just u. I can actually factor u out of this, and u is a non-negative quantity, so I can pull that all the way in front of the magnitude. And then after I do that and I square what's left inside, that's going to be the quantity 2u cosine v squared. So that's 4u squared cosine squared of v. And then 4u squared sine squared v. And then just plus 1. So overall, the length of this cross product is going to be u times the square root of 4u squared plus 1. Okay, now we have everything to set up this integral. We're not going to actually integrate it. We're just going to write it in nice double integral form from which you would just proceed in the usual way with antiderivatives. So if we wanted to integrate f over this surface, so the surface is the domain of integration with respect to surface area, we can now evaluate this by integrating from 0 to 2, integrating from 0 to pi over 2, f of r of u and v, so that's what we computed in step 2, that's u squared cosine v sine v, times the length of the cross product, which is going to be u times the square root of 4u squared plus 1, and then du dv. I think you actually could integrate this by hand one nice feature is that it's an integration over a rectangle in terms of u and v, so all the bounds are constant. And then the integrand factors into a function of u times a function of v, so you could actually separate it into the product of two single integrals, which is nice. But I'll leave this here, because the rest of this computation would just be routine double integration. We want to compute the mass of the lamina occupying the region in R3, which we could describe as z equals the square root of 16 minus x squared minus y squared, and z is greater than or equal to 2, with density function sigma of x, y, and z equals z. So this is our lamina up here. It's part of the upper hemisphere of radius 4. But it's only the part of the hemisphere that sits above the plane z equals 2. So let's parametrize this surface, and we'll evaluate our density function for that parametrization We'll compute the cross product we need together with its length, and then we'll set up and possibly solve the integral that will give us the mass of this lamina. We have part of a sphere, so I'm going to use spherical coordinates, and notice that at every point on the sphere, the radius is 4. So the radius is not a parameter. What our parameters are theta. For theta, it looks like we have 0 to 2 pi because we have a full revolution around the z-axis and phi, the angle measured down from the North Pole. To see phi, I've given you a side profile of this hemisphere, so we just see it pictured in the yz plane. Phi values are going to go from 0 down to this angle here. To figure out that maximum value for phi, what I'm going to do is use the z coordinate. We reach that maximum value when z equals 2. On the sphere, z is rho cosine phi. 
So rho cosine phi has to be equal to two. Rho we actually have to be four. So we can say that cosine of phi is two fourths, also called a half. So that tells us that that maximum value for phi is pi over three. Okay, so our parameters are gonna be the two angles, theta and phi. We have bounds for them which are constant, so that's really nice. So for the first step here, I'm going to set up my parameterization. I think I will switch to u and v. You could set this up with theta and phi as the name of your parameters, that's fine too, but I'm gonna switch over to u and v. So I'll say r of u and v is the x-coordinate, which in spherical coordinates is rho cosine theta sine phi. Rho is four, so this is gonna be four cosine u sine v. The y-coordinate will be four sine u sine v. And then the z-coordinate is four cosine v. Okay, now let's evaluate our function, which is sigma of x, y, and z equals z for this parameterization. So what is sigma of r of u and v? This density function is not too complicated. It just extracts the third input, which when we do this composition is gonna be four cosine v. Okay, for the third step, let me compute r sub u, r sub v, and the length of their cross product. So r sub u, it's gonna be differentiation with respect to u. So that's negative four sine u sine v, four cosine u sine v, and then zero. Okay, so to compute r sub v, I wanna differentiate with respect to v. The first entry will be four cosine u cosine v. The second entry will be four sine u cosine v. And the third entry will be negative four sine v. Okay, now let's set up and compute the length of their cross product. Okay, since I've stacked these on top of each other, it's not too hard to go ahead and take the cross product. The first entry is negative 16 cosine u sine squared of v. The second entry will be negative 16 sine u sine squared of v. And I'll write out the full third entry. It's going to be negative 16 sine squared of u cosine v sine v minus 16 cosine squared of u cosine v sine v. We have both a sine squared of u and a cosine squared of u in that third term. So you can see that third term will simplify to just negative 16 cosine v sine v. Let me notice that I could factor the negative 16 sine of v out from every term here. When I take the absolute value of that, it's gonna be 16 sine v because sine is positive for v values going from zero to pi over three. I just realized I never wrote the bounds of my parameters up at the top, so let me do that. Zero is less than or equal to u is less than or equal to two pi. And zero is less than or equal to v is less than or equal to pi over three. Okay, so before I compute the magnitude of this vector, let me factor out what all the terms have in common. So in front, I'm gonna put the positive scalar 16 sine v. So it's going to be that number times the length of cosine u sine v, sine u sine v, and then the last term is actually just gonna be cosine v after simplification. After all that simplification, the remaining length is not too bad. So we're gonna get 16 sine v times the square root of cosine squared u sine squared v plus sine squared u sine squared v plus cosine squared v. The first two terms inside the square root are gonna to simplify to sine squared of v and then we're gonna have sine squared of v plus cosine squared of v. So actually this simplifies to the square root of one. So therefore the length of this cross product is 16 sine v. Okay, so now we have everything we need to set up this integral. To compute the mass of this lamina, we wanna evaluate density across the area of this lamina. So that's going to be doing the surface integral of the density function. But to compute that, we use our parameterization. So we're gonna integrate from zero to two pi for u, zero to pi over three for v. The density function evaluated across the parameterization, which we computed in step two, so that's four cosine v, times the length of the cross product that we computed in step three, 
which is 16 sine V. And then the way I've ordered this, it's dV du. The bounds are constant and the integral factors into a function of V times one. So I can write this as the product of two single integrals. So I'll say it's 64 times the integral from zero to two pi of one du times the integral from zero to pi over three of cosine V sine V. Let U be sine of V so that du is cosine V dV. And we're left with 128 pi times the integral from zero to square root of three over two, u du. Overall, that's going to be 48 pi. Assuming here that we were working with standard units, it would be 48 pi kilograms.